it's a real pleasure to talk about uh, this topic because I think it's very pertinent to all of us here um, and what we're navigating through uh, new opportunities, let's say. Uh, I remember uh, probably about four years ago, I was at a Bible study with Sean Knights. Many of you know Sean Knights, and I saw him on the call, so it's nice to see you, Sean. And uh, we were having a uh, discussion largely around um, the issue of obedience. And uh, there's a lot of back and forth. And I remember uh, Sean sort of stopped the conversation. He looked over at me and he said, KR, can you talk to the guys here and just say, you know, just let them know how you came to hear from God so clearly. And, um, and I knew where Sean was leading me. And I think, I think he was looking for that response that it was through obedience and there's no doubt that that's uh, part and parcel of how we hear from God. But as I looked over and as I spoke to Sean, I said, Sean, I can summarize uh, that answer in one word and it's pain. Um, and uh, you're going to maybe find that peculiar in a bit uh, in, in some ways. But when, when we take a look at, um, our biblical heroes and those that have come into this place to understand the relationship that we have with God in a deeper way, we see that a lot of times our relationship with God actually is enhanced in great times of trouble. And so there's a question that's before us all today. What does that mean to us here and now? How do we come into this place to have a deeper relationship with God? What does it mean for him to navigate us through some extraordinary circumstances, some times of uncertainty? And uh, how do we respond in part to that? Um, this week, I was reading Psalm 35. And Psalm 35 is a psalm that David wrote uh, when he was being chased by King Saul. And uh, it, it was a premise just as he was in the, um, uh, in the regions where he was in mountainous areas. And I think that we might all know of the Bible story whereby uh, King Saul enters into a cave and, and David cuts, cuts off a corner of his robe, sparing his life. Uh, as I was reading through this psalm, I was actually reading in the, in the Passion Translation, which is more of a paraphrase than anything. And it was interesting because it highlighted three aspects of the approach that uh, David gave in the psalm in his conversation with God. And I'm going to highlight some of that with us here. When we take a look at the uh, when we take a look at the psalm, we see three major areas. We see David in his role as a warrior, and you see the the tone uh, which uh, he talks about. Oh Lord, fight for me! Harass the hecklers! Accuse my accusers! Fight for those who fight against me! Uh, but, but then he goes on and he says, you know, put put on your armor, Lord. Take up your shield and protect me. Rise up, mighty guy, grab your weapons of war and block the way of the wicked who come to fight against me. Stand for me when they stand against me. And I like this part really, uh, this part really speaks to me. And I see this over and over and over again in the Psalms, where when David is in the greatest challenge, we see that David is in this place where he's asking God to do something within him, something at the level of the soul. And we see this in, in this battle David says, speak over my soul. I am your strong savior. What, a, what an interesting concept it is to understand that in these times, God's actually looking to speak to us and our orientation and ultimately how we see God. And I think that when we take a look at the challenging time, we get to buttress this with opportunity. David goes on in the psalm to talk about how he becomes a, a, a witness of who God is. And he carries on uh, saying, Lord, how long are you going to uh, stand by here? And he goes, rescue me from these brutal men, for I'm being torn to shreds from them. Save me from their rage. And then he goes on, then I will praise you wherever I go and wherever uh, when everyone gathers for worship, I will lift up your praise with a shout in front of the largest crowd. 
And then the last part of this psalm, we see David the worshiper. And I love this aspect of David. David's always starting out with the challenge in the psalm. And at the end, you start to see this heroic victory that he's praising his God. And it, and it goes on, but let all my true friends shout for joy, all those who know and love what I do for you. Let them all say, the Lord is great. He delights in the prosperity of his servants. Then I won't be able to hold it in. Everyone will hear my joyous praises all day long. Your righteousness will be the theme of my glory and my song of praise. When we take a look at First uh, Samuel, we, we get a peek into this relationship that David had with God. And he, prior to entering into this uh, mountainous area, he's in, um, he's in a town called uh, Kela. And uh, Kela is uh, being overrun by the Philistines. And he goes to God and he specifically asks God, God, should we, should we come in? And God speaks back and gives him very specific direction. Go in, I will deliver the, the Philistines into your hand. And even when he's facing doubt afterwards, David goes right to God and, Dave, and God comes back and says, I will deliver them. He even deals with the, the questions of doubt that we have with respect to what God's already told us in our life. I, um, I remember uh, my, my dad was a, a police officer with uh, the same police department that I was. And he was a senior officer, he was there for 35 years. And I remember one time a story of a gentleman by the name of Phil Ritchie. Phil Ritchie had taken his sailboat out in the early uh, spring and uh, he had um, uh, started to chart from Oakville to, no uh, to Niagara on the Lake. And he had told his girlfriend that he would meet her in Niagara on the Lake in several hours. Uh, but several hours had passed and a storm had, uh, had uh, brewed up. And his girlfriend called into the police department saying that, she, that her boyfriend had not arrived as planned. Well, Several hours after that, they actually found uh, the sailboat uh, on the shores of uh, Lake Ontario, uh, just in Beamsville, which is a city just outside of St. Catharines. But there was no Phil Ritchie. My dad was the incident commander on that call, and he called out the Coast Guard, the adjacent uh, police departments in the Hamilton and Holton region, and they began a, a search and rescue for Phil Ritchie. Now, if anybody understands the odds of uh, what occurs when somebody goes overboard, a lot of times people are knocked unconscious and in the early uh, spring, uh, the waters are cold and um, uh, survival rates are, are limited. So after almost a day went by, the Coast Guard called off the search and the other adjacent police departments called off the search. But my dad, my dad, my dad was a sailor and he held hope for this man. And so as, uh, as 24 hours passed, he had the canine police still combing the uh, shores of Lake Ontario, all the way from Hamilton to Niagara on the Lake. And lo and behold, they found Phil Ritchie. He had washed ashore a day afterwards and they found him and he was suffering from extreme hypothermia. And but for that planned rescue, he would have certainly died. See, Phil Ritchie got knocked over in the midst of a storm and he didn't know what was happening. And I can promise you he was struggling to understand how he was even going to be able to survive. And the last thing he was thinking about was whether somebody was going to be combing the shores once he reached there. He was, I'm certain, just trying to get to the shore. But there was other people in play. And it was interesting, in this case, it was my father that was coordinating this rescue plan. And we start to realize that God has a plan for us and God has for a plan for us right now, here and now. And he knows what we're going through and he knows exactly what's needed for us to be able to survive and not only survive, but be called into something much greater than this. When I start to reflect on the story of King David and how he came to understand and know God I started to realize that it was his time as a shepherd boy that gave him the intimacy and relationship with God. It was those quiet times when he actually didn't have much else to do, probably other than learn to play his harp and speak to his God. 
It is in those instances that he came to know that God would be with him no matter what. See, we see when David is called to um, bring uh, bread and cheese to his brother as they were uh, up against uh, Goliath the giant, that David volunteers to fight Goliath. And in that instance, we see that David tells King Saul, it was in the times that I was in the fields uh, pastoring the sheep and such, that my God saved me, that my God saved me from the jaws of a lion, from the, from the claws of a bear. And David came to understand that no matter what the circumstance was, God was going to be there and God was going to deliver him. And so in those quiet times of challenge and personal strife, God birthed in David something whereby he can go and lead a nation. And as David was called and anointed into that, he knew that he could trust his God and he knew that he could hear them. I think that we have an opportunity now. I think that there are new rhythms to our life. I think that everybody's adjusting to that. But there's something else that's happened here. It's sort of like when I was a kid. I remember on Sundays, all the stores were closed. Uh, we were forced to spend time with family and it was actually a great thing. It was, my memories are tied to those times. And I miss those times and the busyness of today. But I start to see that now we actually have more time for family or with family. And we also have other time that's available to us. And we, must, we uh, find ourselves, I'm sure, engaged in monitoring the news and in monitoring social media. But I think that there's a time that God's calling all of us into to know him better, to know him in a deeper way. I was on a, uh, uh, a men's group Zoom call yesterday morning, and one of the men had mentioned how he went to Walmart and that the section in the uh, book section that contained the Bibles was completely sold out. It was completely empty. People are yearning for God, and rightfully so. And I can tell you that as Christians, we are being called into something deeper. We are being prepared for something greater. And much like David learned how to hear from the voice of uh, God in the, in, in the quiet times, I would say now is a time for us to be able to draw closer, to dedicate time into the new rhythms of life. I remember when I was, um, when I was 16, I, uh, I was so excited to get my license. Uh, I don't know who can uh, name this model, but this is a 1987 Hyundai Pony. And th this, was, this was my stepmother's car she, would, uh, she had always desired, and she got her own car. And lo and behold, on my 16th birthday, actually, it wasn't, it wasn't actually on my 16th birthday. It was the day following my 16th birthday because it was on Easter that year. I went down to the, driver's, uh, the driver uh, bureau, and I took my uh, G1, or it wasn't G1 back then, it was beginners, sorry about that, no graduated li licensing. Once you hear the rest of the story, you'll understand why graduated licensing came into play. But I, re I received my beginners, and off I was in my, uh, my stepmother's uh, new Hyundai Pony. And I traveled first thing to go see my girlfriend in St. Catharines, and um, I don't know uh, if many of you know the Niagara region, but in the Niagara region, we have um, what's known as the Garden City Skyway. It's sort of like the Burlington Skyway. It goes over the Welland Canal. And I was driving over the Garden City Skyway. But the reality is I just, I didn't have, um, I didn't have wisdom then. It was evident. Uh, it, it's very much helping me with raising teenagers as I can reflect on my own mistakes. But at that time, I thought that a vehicle could go as fast as what the speedometer said it could go. So as I was driving, driving over the, the uh, Garden City Skyway, I was probably going about 180 kilometers an hour. Now, a Hyundai Pony uh, is not suited with great tires. In fact, they're only 13-inch tires. They're not much bigger than motorcycle tires. And I was traveling much too fast for uh, that vehicle to be able to handle any situation. And as I went to overtake another vehicle, I lost control of the vehicle. And I started to go into a wobble. And right at the end of the Skyway, I rolled my vehicle right off the, right off the embankment. Um, and thank God it wasn't uh, 
10 seconds before because I would have went over the skyway. I rolled the vehicle over. Uh, the passenger in the rear of the vehicle actually didn't have his seatbelt on and uh, his lip imprints were actually found on the back of the hatchback window. And we've all walked out of that uh, accident uh, unscathed. Uh, but the, the OPP officer that arrived decided to drive me home. And I was white as a ghost. I had no idea what I was going to say to my dad and nor what I was going to say to my stepmother. And as I walked into the house, I saw my father there and he had me sit down. The OPP officer left and he looked at me and he said, son, I want you to come outside with me. We walked outside, he handed me the car key. He said, son, I want you to get in the vehicle. I want you to get in the driver's seat. And he went on to go in the passenger seat and he made me drive to my driver's ed class that I had scheduled that night. My dad saw something deeper in the circumstance than what I could see at that time. The last thing I wanted to do was carry on. Yeah, I was quite comfortable in the fear overriding me. I didn't want to drive ever again. I felt that I had lost that opportunity. I felt that I had made a mistake that was too grave for me to be able to do that. But my dad saw something different. He actually didn't let fear be the thing that drove through. He allowed me to drive. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't fear driving, and I haven't feared driving that day since that day. But I can tell you the only reason I hopped into the driver's seat that day is because I could trust my dad. I could trust the character of my father that what he was saying was more valuable than what I was feeling. This is what these times are for. These times are an opportunity for us to dive deeper into our relationship with God, for us to come into a place of testing, whereby we will see that God will provide for us relationally in the time of financial need and the time of great uncertainty. This is our joy. This is what we are called into. I find in my life, since I've submitted my life to, to Christ and moved and transitioned from living a life of a nominal Christian to that of one that not only has surrendered to God, but one that knows God. I've come into the place where there's been a rewriting of my habits, a rewriting of my daily habits. And, and it's in these instances where I get to know God more. The more I'm in prayer, the more that I'm reading my Bible, the more that I see that he's speaking to me the more that I understand his goodness and his love. And I start to speak to him saying, Lord, speak to my soul so that I may come into agreement with who you truly are, so that I may understand that Christ is in me, that there's been something that's been transformed, and now I have the ability to recognize the goodness of the Father in any situation and that it overrides my fear. I want to encourage you, as you enter into the new rhythms of your day, to take aside uh, some time and to just ask, how can I take advantage of this opportunity to really connect with my family? How can I take advantage of this opportunity to really connect with God? There are some great applications out there to be able to aid if you take a look at the uh, Version Bible app. There are daily devotional plans, which are a fantastic way to just set up something whereby there's a rewriting of the godly habits uh, that allow us to see Christ birthed and born in us, but even more so allow us to further enrich ourselves with understanding the character of the Father. There's also another application out there called Read Scripture. It's an app you can find. It'll bring you through the Bible in one year. We can start off with lofty goals and say, I'm going to go and set aside two or three hours today with God and read my Bible and pray and such like this. 
but I encourage you to mark aside 20 minutes a day. Brother Andrew, who uh, famously wrote God, uh, God's Smuggler, and who um, it was the founder of Open, Ar Open Doors uh, Ministries, he stated one thing uh, when I was watching one of his clips sometimes. He said, I find that if I don't start my devotions in the morning with God, I find I very rarely find him at any other point in the day thereafter. And so as you re-explore what the, your rhythms of your life are, I challenge you to take a look and see how we can all together press into a deeper relationship with God that we'll be able to trust him in this circumstance and that we will actually be coming out of this in a much richer, truer expression of the fellowship that we have at Christian Legal Fellowship. Thank you.